to cloud. All right, now we are going to talk about volumes of solids of revolution uh, using the disks and washers method, also sometimes called by slices. Um, and so just as a quick introduction as to what we mean here, uh, what we're going to be talking about, imagine we took something that looks like this. All right, and so again, generic uh, integral from A to B rather over a certain area. Well, imagine you took this thing and you rotated it around the x-axis. What you would get is something like this. Sort of rotating this thing around, you'd get the same thing on the top and the bottom. And then to show that it's kind of three-dimensionally rotated, we're going to give it a kind of round cap there. And we're going to have a bunch of little kind of lines that show that this thing is a rotation. And so it looked kind of like a cup. And what we're, we're thinking of this as, it was we're thinking of this thing as a solid. So it's taking all of the area that's trapped between there and you're rotating all of that around to generate an entire, not a hollow cup, but rather a solid cup. And later in this chapter, we'll see ways that we can find the surface area of that hollow cup. But we're starting off as imagining it a solid cup. Uh, as usual in math, first, we have to do a little bit of background to build our way up there. So back to things we've seen. Area between curves and the definition of the of a integration. So a definite integrals in particular. So we know, as we saw in the last section, definite integrals can be used to find the area under a curve. So there's just a nice example where I've calculated it out and given us the approximate answer, because that's oftentimes helpful when we're doing areas. I notice the scale is a little weird. The y-axis is shrunk and the x-axis is stretched, so it doesn't look like, but yeah, those rectangles are all one square unit. So yeah, it looks like there are 4.6-ish trapped of those. Now we're going to revisit, and it was at the very beginning, when we first learned about integration, we learned about something called Riemann sums, where we approximated the area underneath this curve by kind of taking some key points on the x-axis, key points on the x-axis, or I'm sorry, no, uh, key points on our graph, which are related to these kind of inputs. All right, let me start again. Riemann sums, you break up the integral, the, the interval that you're going to integrate over into a set number of steps, a partition, if you will. And we call this, the width of each one of these steps, you call it delta x, representing the width of our partition equals our width. And in this case, we're going by steps of size 1 half. And so we generate four rectangles between 0 and 2. And each of these little things, is the midpoint. It happens to be the midpoint. So this is one fourth. This is three fourths. This is uh, five fourths. And this is seven fourths. And so this is all review. So uh, just, just sit and enjoy and, and hear this. Um, a shorthand notation for these values is sometimes something to the tune of like x sub i or x star sub i, where it's just some point in that partition in each step of that partition. So that would be x1, and this uh, 3 fourths would be x2, and 5 fourths would be x3, and so forth. And that's what we're referring to over here in the, in the from, you have the sum, the sum from 1 to 4 of our function being evaluated at these, these value, these 1 fourth, 3 fourth, 5 fourth, a point in each partition step will give you the dots on the curve, the output of that function, because this curve is f of x. So plug in x star, you're going to get f of x star. And that's going to be the height of the rectangle. So this is the height of our rectangle. And over here, we saw that delta x represents the width of our rectangle. And so height times width, what we've really done is you've got the area of each rectangle there I'm using shorthand. And if you add up the area of all the rectangles, you're going to get the sum of those blue areas. And so the sum of those blue areas is 4.625. And sure, um, 
it looks like over here we over we don't include that part but then we do include that part and so there's a little overshoot undershoot and whatnot it turns out that this is an underestimate of the exact area which we we calculated above now the definition of integration is if you take a, you want a better estimate well you make those narrower those rectangles smaller and smaller and smaller until they're basically so thin that they're basically just an individual line and you sum up all of those if you let the limit of n go to infinity you're going to take so many slices that you're basically summing up individual little lines just so thin here so thin that you you end up adding up the entire area exactly when you let n go to infinity and that is the definition of an integral so what we're going to do is we're kind of going to exploit this idea where if you if you take tiny little partitions and add them all up you can get a sum of something like so we've done it for area we're going to apply the same idea to volumes and one of the like very very common ways to introduce this is to just draw a picture of a loaf of bread all right so bear with me here all right so what we're going to have is a little bit of an area off to the left so that i can do this all right so let's think we want a little bit of a diagonal thing because that's from that angle and then from that we're going to go up a little bit from that we're going to other side we're going to go up the same distance and then we're going to go over our little loaf of bread that kind of lump that it gets when it's baked above the when it rises uh oven spring when it rises in the pan and bakes then we're going to go back at an angle and we're going to go again go up from that the same distance and we're going to give it kind of the same bump if you will but we're going to stop there and we'll connect this and that to me looks somewhat like a loaf of bread and so how could we figure out the volume of this loaf of bread it's not like it's a rectangular thing uh, that has a nice easy way to figure it out and so what we're going to do is we're going to think okay well well maybe just maybe I could take the volume of a single slice of bread that might be slightly easier to figure out in some way and so we're going to name this a of x uh well never mind sorry we're not there yet we're going to take the volume of the slice of bread and we're going to add them all up so uh and to do this we're going to say all right well take a bunch of slices let's let this base this distance right here let's let the base be the x-axis and what is the volume of this slice of bread well if we're going to cut this thing up into a bunch of pieces let's let delta x represent the width of our slice and then since this thing this individual slice is actually if we could how do you how do you find the volume of a tin can tin can or a circle yeah some kind of a thing with a circular base well the volume of something with a circular base is actually the area of the base times the height so area of the base times the height equals volume for this tin can volume equals area of the base times the height and I'm, I, yeah i know i'm using a of x such a little weird in my example here but we're going to name the area of x is going to be the area of the face of the slice of bread and we're pretty good at areas we just talked a lot about how to use integration to calculate areas so putting these ideas together we could say that we have the volume of one slice of bread could be represented by as a function since we've made the uh base of the bed x-axis and define the width in terms of delta x and then define the area of the base in terms of x the volume of the bread is for the same reason the tin can it's the area of that base or that face a of x times the height which in this case is delta x now that looks an awful lot like uh well a of x being expressed you know over here we had a of x expressed as an integral so it seems like this is the ideas are somehow related so let's explore this just a little bit further so how do you get a better approximation of volume in the same way we took more rectangles to get a better approximation of area we're going to get more slices equals better volume And so if we uh, we take the, so here, 
if we take the volume um, v of x, well, v of x depends on something. V of x depends on our choice of delta x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, how do you get more slices? How do you get more slices? Well, you take delta x, the size, the width of those slices, and you let that approach 0. Get thinner and thinner and thinner will give you more slices. And so the, the limit as we get more and more slices, as the number of slices goes to infinity, is actually delta x goes to 0. Um, well, how many slices are we going to have here? I'm playing a little fast and loose with some notations here, but say we have n slices for our bread. Well, if you let the size delta x go to zero, that's the same thing as saying that n runs off to infinity. The number of slices goes to infinity. Well, so now look at our function that we have up here. v of x is the same thing as a of x delta x. Well, if we're going to take delta x to be thinner, we're going to add all these slices together to get the sum of our volume of our bread, add the volume of an individual slice, add all of them together. Well, we're going to let this sum, it's going to be in terms, oh wait, I need more room, I'm sorry. Uh, the sums, leaving a little room for my limit over there, the sum, our approximation for all of the loaf of bread is going to be for i equals 1 to n, n being the number of slices, it's going to be a of x, leave a little bit of space there, delta x. Just like we did, we used x of i to be the point in each slice of our area calculation. x of i here is going to be the, you know, the point in each of our slices here. Uh, that defines each of our slices. And so for n slices, you sum up all the individual n volumes to get the whole, or yeah, individual n volumes. But if you want to make that the best estimate ever, you let n go to infinity as delta x goes to zero. And so you get infinitely thin slices of volume. Well, what does an infinitely thin slice of volume look like? An infinitely thin slice of volume looks like one single piece of bread that is sliced so thin that it's paper thin. It just becomes the area of that slice of bread. And so this, if you do a little bit of playful, playful uh, application of the definition of integration, that expression right there, limit at the very bottom of this prior slide, as n goes to infinity of f of x delta x, well, just a of x delta x, that's the same thing as the definition of the integral of a of x. So this is quite literally from a to b integrating the area dx. So fun fact, to find the volume in terms of x of some three-dimensional object, if you can define the area of a slice of that, a single slice of that um, solid, that volume, you can integrate the area function. And when you integrate the area function, you end up with the volume. OK, so the key idea here is that we're summing up infinitely thin slices of volume. But when you have an infinitely thin slice of volume, what you actually have is an area. So we're summing up infinitely thin slices of volume, approximating that volume by area to get the overall volume of our uh, region. So how can we use this to calculate volumes of solids of revolution? So let's take a look. There's the graph that's related to the thing that I kind of suggested at the beginning. So let's redraw. What's this going to look like? If we revolve this shape around this, the x-axis and got a solid, I'm just going to draw, and I'm being real careful here, I'm going to revolve this thing around the x-axis here, and we're going to draw what that would look like. So give yourself a positive y-axis and a positive x-axis, and we see that it goes from 0 to 4. So I'm just going to go out to 4. And uh, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to choose two here, right in the middle, as a kind of a nice value. And don't worry about the y-axis uh, scale. We'll just draw that function there. And like we did at the beginning, if you imagine rotating this thing around the x-axis, well, 180 degrees around the x oh x-axis is just going to give you the exact same shape on the bottom. And then to show that we rotated it, what happens when you rotate something? You get a any point rotated around is going to generate a nice circle. So our cap is a circle. And so this thing is a solid. 
and every single step of the way. Can I make this a little less opaque? Oh man, sometimes when you, you figure out nice features, that looks pretty good. Real thin lines to just show that we're rotating this thing around. So what is going to happen if we just focus on kind of one particular point, one point, or even better, even better than one point, how about just a little chunk here, just a little chunk of interval? Well, that there is an area that we know how to calculate, just that vertical from the x-axis thing. And what happens if you rotate this thing all the way around? Well, if you rotate this thing all the way around, you're going to get uh, well, that's gonna that's if I took the top of that thing and rotated it all the way around, and then if I did the same again, uh, now I'm just kind of having fun with the fact that I can make this thing opaque. I can control the opacity of this thing. What you end up with is kind of a solid circle, a solid disk, if you will. And uh, this disk, this disk, well, circles are involved. And what's important when we're talking about circles? The radius. And so what we have is a very thin disk. And now I'm realizing that my earlier example of how do you calculate the volume of a cylinder? Here's our disk is kind of helpful here. Well, the volume of a disk is equal to the area of the base times the height. And so the base is a circle and the area of a circle is pi r squared times the height. And I apologize for having written over my thing there. So the volume of this disk slice is going to be pi r squared times the height. And r, the radius, is defined and we can express in terms of our original function f of x. f of 2 is going to be equal to the radius at that point. So you kind of imagine taking that point and rotating it around. If you had this, this disk was sliced so thin that it was just the point to rotate it around, you're going to come up with just an infinitely thin slice of volume that is a circle. And we know how to calculate the area of this thing. This thing has area of x is equal to pi r squared, but our radius is given in terms of f of x, so it's pi times f of x, the quantity squared. OK. So taking this idea, I, I skipped ahead in my notes from what I planned to, but I, I'm OK with this. All right, so let's just look at the volume of one slice. So volume of one slice here. And in fact, I'm going to focus on the volume of a one slice that is drawn over here in blue, this thin disk. Um, forgive me for a second. OK, quick cough. All right, uh, muted myself. All right, next, we're going to draw a picture about this thin slice. So two-dimensional picture about the slice. At two, it's a little thicker. It's got some width there. So this slice has a little bit of width. And so what is the height of this? We're going we're gonna to imagine the height is given right there at two. Well, so we need to know what this function is. And this function is the square root function. If you look at it, Square root of one is one, square root of four is two. Yep, it's the square root function. So that height is going to be given by f of two. And f of two, what is this point? That point right there is x comma f of x. And that's just true of functions. So 
this thing gives us the radius of our of our disk, if you will, R. It's a pretty poor R. All right, so let's let's work with this. Uh, to calculate our radius, we need the actual value of our radius. R is equal to F of two. And if you plug two into the square root, you just get root two. And so the volume of our disk, let's, let's say that this disk has a, high, a width, we'll name the width here, delta X. So the volume of our did, disk the role of the height is going to be played by delta x, and the radius is going to uh, give us the area of the base, that circular area of the base. So the volume of our disk is going to be the volume of this disk, which is in terms of x associated in particular with the x input 2, is equal to the area of the base, our area of our circle, times our height. And our height is given by well, I'm sorry, our area of our base is pi r squared. Well, our radius is square root of two squared times our height. Our height is delta x. And so this gives us the square root of two is two. Yeah, square root of two squared is two. So we get two pi delta x gives us the volume of our singular disk. Oops, I meant to have this all on one slide. Oh, good, we have a second slide here. All right, so continuing this on, if you can take the volume of one slice, we're now gonna extend this idea to multiple slices. So our general idea so far is that we have the area of Xi for one slice. Each of these disks uh, is a thin slice of volume. The, the, the volume of an infinitely thin disk is approximated by the area of the base of that disk. And the area of a circle is pi r squared. And then the height, so that we can make it a volume approximation, is going to be times that delta x. But as we saw in the definition of an integral, you let delta x go to 0. And so it doesn't, you're not multiplying by 0. It just becomes the differential in the integrand. And so for our individual thing, the example we had uh, in general, instead of plugging in a specific input for x, the radius r is given by our function f of x, which is equal to the square root of x. Our radius is going to be played, the role of the radius is going to be played by the square root of x. So the square root of x squared for radius squared times delta x is going to give us pi times x delta x. And then add up all the volumes of all disks. And you're going to say, OK, so the sum from i equals 1 to infinity, because we're going to take an infinite number of thin disks and sum them up, volumes of xi. Each volume is given by the sum from i equals infinity, i equals one to infinity of, well, the volume is given by this, this uh, area function times uh, delta x to give us the approximation of the height. And that is the definition of an integral. And for this particular problem, we're gonna go from zero to four, popping back to the picture. Yep, we're integrating from, we wanna sum up all the disks starting at zero all the way to four. And so from zero to four, and this area function here, well, we calculated that above, pi of x dx in integral form, uh, delta, pi of x delta x becomes pi x delta x in the integral. And evaluating that super quick, pi x integrated gives us pi over two x squared, add one to the exponent and then put it under the coefficient as division, evaluated from zero to four, plug that in and you get eight pi. So the volume of this solid cup from zero to four, if we rotate the square root of x around the x-axis, gives us a relatively nice number of eight pi. Seems a little abstract, and I think it usually takes a little bit of practice. That's what we're gonna do. But first we're gonna walk through 
the general process and a way to approach this. So as we've seen, or as I've mentioned rather, volume can be found by integrating an area of a function of a, of a shape. If you know all the slices, the uh, function that expresses the area. And so when we are rotating things around the axis, well, the area is always going to be the area of a circle. And the area of a circle is pi r squared. So over here, you're going to have pi, and our radius is going to be given in terms of some function r of x that defines the radius of each slice. So in general, to do these problems and attack it, um, I like to do it this way. You like to, I like to draw a reasonably good version of the original graph or use a graphing utility to help me draw that. And then I try and do my best to sketch a, a, a version of the 3T rotated graph. And then I like to draw a, a single slice, a single two-dimensional disc that, of a really thin slice of volume and use that kind of picture to find the formula for the radius. And once I have the formula for the radius, I can then fill it into this formula and do the integration. Well, what if we wanted to rotate about the y-axis? No problem. The role of x is now going to be played by y. And so pi r of y quantity squared is going to be our formula there. And as I mentioned before, if you're ever doing a problem in terms of y and you know that you're going to uh, integrate over the y-axis, put dy in there first. Kind of set up the blank interval integral with some space and put dy in there as a, as a reminder and a helper to say, oh yeah, this thing needs to be in terms of y. I need to solve my variables and my expressions in terms of y. That's enough theory. Let's do an example. So we're going to calculate the volume of a sphere. And how we're going to do that is we are going to use a circle. And a generic formula of a circle centered at the origin is x squared plus y squared is equal to some radius squared. And I don't want to use r because r is a radius. And so I'm going to use the generic variable. No, we'll use r. r is perfectly good. r. r squared. Here, r is not a variable. It is a number. It is a constant value. So kind of walking our way, what, we're, what are we going to do with this circle? We're going to do the circle, and we're going to rotate it. Whoops. Rotate about the x-axis. In general, I think it's easiest to first learn things in terms of x before you start introducing too many y's. OK. So let's draw first our two-dimensional picture, our original function. So our original function is this, and it's a circle of radius r. So it has on the y-axis and x-axis, it has from negative r to positive r, respectively. OK, so what we're going to now do is we're going to, sorry, this thing is, we're going to rotate. We're going to rotate it about the x-axis. And sometimes I like to draw the little rotation thing in there. Um, do you need to rotate the entire circle around? No. We're going to see that uh, what we're really going to rotate is just the, just the upper portion of the circle. But we'll get into that in a bit. So what is this thing going to look like when we rotate it? Well, so once again, I'm going to give myself just kind of a generic set of axes. I'm going to give myself my circle there. And when you rotate this thing around the x-axis, you're going to end up with a sphere that looks something like this. And if you focus in on a single point, and you say, hey, what's going to happen at this point here? Well, that point is going to be brought up there. It's going to rotate around till it hits the sphere there. And then it's going to rotate and continue rotating back up and around until it lands right where it is. And so the important part of this is we have an infinitely thin slice of area, which is just a circle, and it has a radius. 
and I'm writing out the word radius. And well, let's give that point a name. Well, it's just a generic name. It's on the x-axis. We're going to let it be x. And so there's, all right, so as we, we're going to start over here at negative r, and we're going to integrate to positive r, and we're going to, we're going to sum up a whole bunch of disks by taking infinitely thin slices from left to right. And each of those slices is going to generate a circle. And then we're going to add the area of all those infinitely thin circles of volume as an infinitely thin circle up. And we're going to get the volume of our sphere. So now I want to draw this thing into a 2D disk picture, focusing just on the thing we're calculating. And so what do we got here? I've got myself again, nice thing there. Give ourselves a circle from r to negative r. And just focusing in on x, an arbitrary x point is going to go up here. And what is this point? That point on my, my thing would be x comma f of x. And we don't know what f of x is yet, but it's going to be important. And that has what? That height uh, there is going to be your f of x on the y-axis. And again, this is our radius. Our radius is determined our radius is going to be equal to f of x. So for a circle, uh, for a circle, what is, this is why we have to focus just on the upper half of this circle. We're going to take x squared plus y squared equals r squared. We're going to solve it for y. y squared equals r squared minus x squared. We're going to take a square root of both sides. We get y is equal to plus and minus square root of r squared minus x squared. Well, the negative version is the lower half of the, the circle below the x-axis. And the positive version of this square root expression is going to be that green upper hemisphere half circle that we have. So this is the expression that we're going to use for the height of our radius as we take those slices from left to right there and add up all those volumes, those areas approximating volumes. So sometimes at this point, I think it's helpful to match our formula to label this thing as r of x is equal to the square root of r squared minus x squared, because I use r of x, capital R of x for radius and when we wrote out our formula. So now that we know all of the formulas, and we've found to calculate it, what is the actual formula for calculating the volume of something? Well, I'm going to use the next slide because I have it, and it gives me, I don't, don't want to cram things up. And so the formula is volume is equal to uh, pi times r of x quantity squared dx, where r of x is your radius formula. We have a version of r of x. So what are we integrating from? Well, we're integrating from negative r to positive r, and I'll flip back to the picture because we're focusing on this, this idea here that we're going from negative r to positive r. We're integrating straight along that x-axis to get all those infinitely thin slices of volume that we're going to approximate with area and add them up. So negative r to r is going to be our integration interval. And that's why I didn't want, yeah, no, we're good. All right, and so pi is just pi. I'm pretty happy with pi. I've got that on lock. Now the radius formula is the square root of r squared minus x squared under a root. End that quantity and square it. All right. Um, I'm sorry for the pause. Uh, all right, let's keep going. Now this just becomes a game of algebra and integration. It could be a little tricky because r is, remember, r is a number. It is not a variable. So pi, uh, if you square a square root, what do you get? Just the stuff inside the square root. So r squared minus x squared dx. So pi and r are just constants. Let's just, you know what, let's, let's factor out the pi. No, let's, let's not, let's, let's distribute it. It's gonna be easier, I think. Pi r squared minus pi x squared dx. Now this, this first expression, pi is a number and r is a number. So this whole thing is just a constant number. So when we integrate that constant number, it's going to be our coefficient pi r squared times x. 
because the integral of 7 is 7x. You just attach an x because of the power rule. All right, now minus pi as the constant, and x squared is going to be x to the third times 1 over 3, and that's all being multiplied together. Vertical bar, uh, we're going to evaluate this thing from negative r to positive r. All right, so now we're going to evaluate this thing from r to negative r. r. Again, keeping in mind that r is a constant. And you know what? Sometimes when you're doing an integral, and here's a tip for Calc 3 when you're working with multiple variables, sometimes it helps because you, you integrated with respect to x. Sometimes it helps to say that right, x is equal to r and x is equal to negative r. And that can help to show you where you're going to plug in your values of r for. And it can be helpful in this problem because you got are being used as both the limits of integration and also a constant that shows up in the expression you're evaluating there as pi r squared x. So pi r squared times r for the top r minus pi times one third times r to the third power minus big parenthesis. Now we'll do negative r pi r squared times negative r minus pi times one third times negative r to the third power, end parenthesis. And you put all this together, what do you get? You get pi r to the third minus pi over three r to the third minus uh, parentheses pi r to the third minus, uh, that's going to be positive because that negative r to the third is going to be negative times negative. So pi over three r to the third power. So uh, you're going to get twice pi r to the third. Uh, no, we're not. No, we're not. No, we're not. You're going to get all this stuff minus pi r to the third minus pi over a third r to the third. Have I messed up the algebra somewhere? Yes, I overlooked a negative. This negative here needs to show up down here. There we go. And that means that, yes, we're going to get, OK, we're going to erase this line because I did a mistake. So sometimes when you make a mistake, it's better to fix it than to plow forward. Actually, I think always, if you make a mistake, it's better to fix it. Equals 2 pi r to the third, um, and then negative positive. It's going to be negative minus 2 pi over 3 r to the third. Do the math on that. Get 4 over 3 pi r to the third power, which is, in fact, the volume formula for a sphere. All right, so continuing on now. All right, so now we're going to do another one. We're going to take a look, and we're going to say, all right, find the volume of a solid rotated, uh, formed by rotating y equals 2 over x about the y-axis over y equals 1 to 4. So now we're going to get the y-axis involved. So first things first, again, draw a picture kind of come up with what a disk looks like after the rotation and go from there. So we'll sketch this and our sketch looks like this. And I definitely use uh, graphing utilities. Desmos is great to help me do this. So uh, if you draw this thing, it looks something like this. Um, so since we're looking only at y equals one to four, well here, let me draw it like this. So if you draw it like this, it goes something like this, something to the tune of that, and then something like that as well. And we're only interested in, in rotating this thing from y equals 1 to y equals 4. So I'll kind of draw the region that I'm going to rotate. And I'll sort of imagine what, what, would, what would happen if I rotated this thing like that about the y-axis. So now we'll try and draw that three-dimensional picture over here. So I'll just give myself a positive upper hemisphere, kind of. Uh, and we'll take that from 4 to 1 on the y-axis. And we'll take just that curve. And well, if you rotate it 180 degrees, it's just going to mirror that exact image. And then at every step of the way, if you look at any one point, you're going to get yourself a nice circle there. And that circle is going to come around in the back as well. And if you look at just a single point, an arbitrary y value, that is going to give you a radius. And when you 
spin that radius around, it's going to carve out a single circle. And that circle is going to have some area that we know how to calculate. And so the thing we need to know in order to calculate that area is that radius, that r radius. So to figure out the radius, I find it helpful to go back to a two-dimensional drawing. Again, we'll just do the first quadrant here, and we'll just give that kind of curve from 1 to 4 on the y-axis, 1 to 4. And if you just look at that, that same value we, we did, an arbitrary y value, the radius here is going to be defined by where you are at on the y-axis. And we're not used to thinking about the y-axis as an input. But you know what? This, this value down here is f of y. It's a function. If we can get our y as the input, then the x-axis values become the output all of a sudden. And so what, what do we know about this curve? Well, so far, we know about this curve that it's y is equal to 2 over x. Well, multiply x on both sides. Dot x dot x is going to give you x, y over 2 divided by y. This is the same thing as once you solve for x, x is equal to 2 over y. And so the x value here on the x-axis can be given by the function 2 over y if you use y as your input. And so this tells us that our radius can be expressed as f of y is equal to 2 over y for any of these slices, any of these slices that's going to generate an infinitely thin volume that will approximate by area. All right, so that gives us our, our function. Our, the thing to plug into our, our integral is the radius function is 2 over y. So now we're ready to evaluate our integral. So the volume of this solid of revolution is going to be given. Well, what are we integrating with respect to? We're doing this over. Our slices are going on the y-axis. And there's that. When I switch to y mode, I always put my differential in first, which gives me a, a really nice sizable hint that y should be the variable of integration. And we've already done the math there. But if you forget that, just by setting up the integral with the correct differential, that can give you a clue that maybe you need to go back and do that math. Anyway, hopefully that's a helpful hint. All right, so what do we got? The formula is pi r squared. And for r squared, we know that our function is 2 over y. And again, uh, we could do this. And I will. I'll work this one just for fun. Um, I may skip some of the algebra steps a little bit. Well, we know that for an integral, you can pop the constant out. Oh, wait, we forgot our limits of integration. Well, our limits of integration are along the y-axis from 1 to 4. So we'll put those in there. Common thing for me to forget if you can sense a theme here. Um, 1 to 4 here. Uh, 2 over y squared is two, 4 over y squared dy. You evaluate that integral as pi integral from 1 to 4, y, uh, 4y to the negative second power dy. Then you can apply the power rule to get pi times well, add 1, negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. Multiply by the reciprocal. So you're just going to get negative pi over uh, y. Uh, don't forget, like I did, about the 4. Uh, so there's a 4 here. We'll make that a 4 and solve that problem. Uh, evaluate this from 1 to 4. Equals, well, that is 4 pi over y evaluated from 1 to 4. That's going to be easier to do the algebra by just working with our negative exponents and rewriting things. We're going to get 4 pi over 4 minus 4 pi over 1 gives us, oh man, I'm making so many mistakes. All right, here we go. Don't forget about this negative. There's a negative out in front of that. So that's negative, and that's negative now. And that's how things are going to work. We're going to get negative pi plus 4 pi for our nice, tidy answer of 3 pi. All right, so a funny looking hat. Rotate that function around the y axis and get yourself a funny looking hat, a solid hat instead of a hollow hat because it's the volume, it's the volume of the solid. All right, next example. 
So we can do other things with this. We do not always have to rotate about the X or Y axis. We can actually rotate this thing on a different line. So let's look at an example. Rotation of a, uh, about a line. A volume of a solid formed by rotating the region bounded by Y is equal to the square root of X and Y equals one and X equals four and all this jazz about the line Y equals one. Well, we better draw a reasonable picture first. To do that, give yourself a first quadrant. Um, okay, I, I get to, I'm getting thrown out of the office at two, so we'll end this at that point. All right, so one, here we go, one. And then on the x-axis, you have from one to four. Those are gonna be good indicators. Okay, so square root of x looks like this. And that's at two, might as well add that. Y is equal to one is going to be this line. See, spoiler alert, I know where all this is, so I'm doing dashed marks where I don't need it. And X is equal to four is the vertical line here. And so, there we go. This is our bounded region. So far, I've only used this information, all three functions, that's where we're at. Now, the second part of this question is we're gonna rotate this thing about the line Y equals one. Well, Y equals one, is this little line y equals one there so we're going to rotate this region around that line so to do the rotation i'm going to rotate it about this line and in three dimensions my picture is going to look something like this one two and zero you got yourself the shape you're going to rotate and the line you're going to rotate it about and so if you rotate that 180 degrees about that line you'll get the bottom half exactly the same and at the top, every, every slice of the way, you're gonna get a circular region. And once again, I find it helpful to just say, okay, to me, it looks like we're gonna take slices in the X direction and the X direction, it goes from one to four. So there's my limits of integration. And I'm gonna slice this thing at an arbitrary X value. And that's gonna generate one of these thin disks, one of these thin disks, uh, that has volume, which we're gonna approximate with area. And so the area of this thing, we need to know the radius. And so what is the radius of this thing? Well, let's, to, uh, it looks easier than it, maybe it looks, I don't know, we'll see. Um, let's draw a pretty good picture for this. Uh, how many slides we got for this thing? Two? Yeah, all right. Okay, so a nice, pretty, pretty good picture here for this thing. Uh, in one dimension, let's look at just that disc and what the radius is. So again, first quadrant, uh, just the piece we're gonna rotate around and just that single slice right there. That single slice has a radius. And the way we find that radius, that's related to this X input between our limits of integration from one to four. Well, that radius has a height, X comma F of X. And in this case, f of x is gonna be our square root function because that's the top of that. But that's not true. If, if, if at x we plugged it in, that would give us something near to, it, it tops out at two. And so it, it would give us a value pretty near two. And I think looking at that picture, we can see that that radius is not actually two, it's, it's closer to one. And so what's the problem here? Well, the problem is, is we have kind of this unwanted extra bit that doesn't actually, it's not part of the radius. And f of x counts that part of the radius. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna think of this as kind of a larger radius here that we have to, we have to use to address this, to, to address the problem of having that extra bit. And so, to find little r, the idea is find the big radius r and subtract away the portion you don't want. And so little radius r equals big radius, which is in red, it's capital R. And we're gonna subtract away the extra bit. Whoops, let's do that in red, extra bit. So for this problem, well, what's our big radius given by? Little radius r, our goal in the picture. Well, the big radius is given by 
the square root of x function. The square root of x output will give us that entire big radius. What is the extra bit? Well, since the extra bit is defined by y equals to 1, that is going to be 1. So for the big radius, you have y equals square root of x gives us that. And for the extra bit, the extra bit is defined by y equals 1 gives us that we're always going to take off one unit off of that height. And that will give us that this little radius is square root of x minus 1 for any slice we take from along that path as we're adding them up. So this tells us that in our formula, the radius function, uh, and this is for the formula, I'm reusing capital R, I'm referring to the integral volume is equal to pi capital R of x quantity squared, I'm referring to that. And so in the formula, our radius function is going to be square root of x minus one. So now we'll plug that in and do the integration. Oftentimes, once you get this game, the hardest part is figuring out what the radius is, because volume equals integral from 1 to 4 of pi times the quantity, our radius function, square root of x minus 1, quantity squared dx. Yes, it's a, uh, it's a function that's going to require a little bit of algebra. This is going to be integral. I'm going to drop the bounds, even though just know that they're there. I'll highlight them. That way, remember to go back to them later. But I'm also going to factor out the pi, let that party outside. This thing squared, well, we know that that's the same thing twice in parentheses. So we're going to distribute that. Square root of x times square root of x is x, uh, just single x. Minus root x times plus minus root x gives us two root x's, because what we're doing is we're just distributing square root of x minus 1 and square root of x minus 1. And then negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1. And so now we see that this problem becomes a an integral that we know how to do. Um, again, recalling that the square root of x can be integrated as x to the 1 half. Doing that gives us pi times 1 half x squared power rule minus 2 um, x to the 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves. And so we're going to multiply this by the reciprocal of 3 halves, 2 thirds, plus 1 integral of 1 is x, and that, and evaluate this rig from 1 to 4 plug in that stuff, and after some sizable algebras, you end up with 7 6 pi as the volume of our rotated region. Now, the one remaining thing we have to talk about is using uh, taking this one step further. And now we're going to do, we can find kind of the volume of sort of hollow things. So let me draw a picture of what I mean by this. So imagine now we have something that looks like this. We want to rotate this thing about the x-axis from A to B. And we have kind of an inner function, which is just going to be, we're going to call this, yep, just an inner function. And then a top function, something like that. And so imagine when we took this region, and rotate it about the x-axis, it would look something like this. So giving ourselves a little bit of a, so this has a height and that has a height. So there's our height. So that, that lower part rotated around is just going to have the identical lower part rotated around. These are both interior to the outer part. So let's do the outer part first. So the top part rotated around is going to have the same top part on the bottom. And that, what's that going to look like? That's going to give us a nice circle on the end. And then a circle here. And we'll just leave it there for now. Now our inner, our inner part is now inside of that, that lower, that lower kind of straight line. So that lower straight line rotated around is going to have another lower straight line rotated around. On the end of this, we're going to be able to see those. And so at the end, it's going to give us kind of this. And we'll be able to see that hole. And then inside, we'll have that piece kind of like that, hollow. And then this other piece like that will sort of like be there. It's kind of like if you imagine the solid and you just punched a cylinder right out the middle of it. This part here 
is all going to be solid and everything in here with that hollow cylinder in the middle. The key idea here is that if we look at a cross section, cross section, in other words, I take a, an x value and I start here and start there. The cross section, as you rotate this thing around, it's going to have the same thing on the bottom. And you're going to get on the outside, you're going to have a visible circle. On the inside, you're going to have more invisible stuff. It's on the inside. And then same in the back and same in the back from the big slice. But this thin, thin slice, what's it look like when you color it in? It looks an awful lot like a washer with a hollow circle in the middle. And so if we look at the cross section, um, and this time again, we just do that single picture there, or along the x-axis, we're rotating around the x-axis. Take a look at for an arbitrary x point, it goes up here, slices like that and then swings down around. And what do you get? You end up with swinging it forward, swinging that forward. It's hard to see in two dimensions, but we're rotating this thing around and you get a washer. And this washer, just like our prior problem, kind of has two radiuses. It's got the big radius, and then it has the smaller inner radius that we're interested in. And so the idea here is the idea, sorry, we'll switch to black here. Uh, find the volume of entire solid, the outer or top function, and then subtract the volume of an inner solid. It's hollow, but we're going to we're going to calculate that inner volume area, and we're going to subtract it out. And so, if we look at the picture again in two dimensions here, you draw a little picture. You go from A to B. You've got your lower area and you've got your kind of top area there, top function. And if you take any x value, the radius that we're actually interested in is this, but the whole thing, that point, that point up on the top is going to be x comma. We'll call this larger radius in red r of x, and we'll call outer radius, the big radius, capital R of X. And then if you look, uh, well, actually, let me connect that. So yeah, if you just, just focus on that top one, you've got a big radius, we'll call that R of X. And then if you focus on the inner one, so here's our outer. And then our inner over here looks like this. We don't need that top function anymore. All we need is this guy, but we'll put him in there just for fun. This one at that same X value, is going to have another little radius. That's going to be little r. And this point is going to be x comma little r of x, the small radius we want to subtract out, little r of x, whereas this whole radius is capital R of x. So if you take this, because of the way integration works, and what we're doing here is what we're going to do is to get washer area. washer area looks like this. And our washer is going to be thought of as the equal to the outer area, which is the entire disk, which is defined by capital R. So that has radius R of x capital R is going to be pi capital R of x quantity squared. And then we're going to take away the inner area of little, uh, the little inner area here, um, the smaller area. And that one is defined by little r of x. It's going to be minus pi times little r of x, quantity squared. 
putting this all together into an integral, volume of a solid of rotation using a washer method, we have volume is equal to, and I want to finish this. We're dangerously close, so uh, let me pause this. I forgot to hit re Zoom recording here, so my apologies. I said some stuff there that didn't get recorded, but we're going to apply this idea to um, our integral, and that's going to give us pi. We now know that a of x is equal to that expression, so it's pi times r of x quantity squared minus pi of little r of x quantity squared dx, where capital R is your outer radius and little r is your inner radius. And you've got a systematic way where you can calculate some volumes. I'm going to use the last little bit here to work one example of this. And so next slide, find the volume of the solid formed by rotating the region bounded by y equals x squared plus 1 and y equals negative x plus 3 about the x-axis. So once again, we'll draw a reasonably accurate picture uh, sketching this x squared plus one is a parabola that starts at one. So it's gonna kind of go up like that. Now, negative x plus three goes up to three on the y-axis and then it's perfectly diagonal down like that. And so what is the region that's trapped by these two functions? This is the region that's trapped by those two functions. And what are we gonna do, rotate it around? We're gonna rotate it around this x-axis. Um, uh, spoiler alert. The intersection is happens at x equals 1 and at x equals negative 2. Set those two things equal to each other and solve them. As we saw in an earlier example, you can solve for the limits of the integration. So if you rotate this thing around, what are you going to get? You're going to get a diagonal line that looks something like that. And then you're going to get a region that looks something like that. And if you put it all together, you're sort of going to get, if you can imagine, Kind of a, kind of that similar to the hat from our earlier example, but sort of a, sort of like a, a hollow. Well, it's gonna it's be it'll be curved on the inside. So sort of a, a hollow donut with curved insides. And uh, oh, I drew my picture wrong. I'm sorry. That line should definitely be inverse there. There we go. Sort of like a curved donut, if you will. All right. So taking that and putting that into one dimension just to look at a single slice. Let's draw a slice in a different color here. Hey bud, thanks for telling me you're watching Caillou, but you gotta leave me alone for a couple more minutes, okay? Then we'll go play, okay? Okay, uh, so if we drew this in one dimension, it would look like this. We'd have a quick axis and we'd have kind of that diagonal line and then we'd have that bottom piece. And if you took a single slice of that, what would that slice look like? That slice would go from here to here. And from there, if you rotated it around, you'd get yourself a washer. You'd have the slice come down there and there would be your interior part. And this would give you the exterior part. And so, um, putting this sort of imagining flattening that washer out, what are going to be our interior and our exterior radiuses? Well, from the center. Arlo, get out of the office now. Read a book. Okay, all right, so this point x comma y up here is related to, let's use some colors. That point x comma y is related to this point right here. Um, what is that point going to be defined as? That's going to be our line. So this is um, x comma negative x plus 3. So that function is going to be our outer, our big radius. And these red and I've used red and um, red and green is good and bad before and things to be subtracted away. I, the green one is related to this point. All right, so green is going to be x comma y, which is given by 
x comma our other function, x squared plus one, the parabola x squared plus one. And so little r of x, little r of x is gonna be x squared plus one. So summarizing that, outer, our large radius is r of x equals negative x plus three. Our inner, the one we wanna subtract away, is gonna be little r of x equals x squared plus one. And now it's time to fire up our integral. And so our integral is going to be v is equal to, we looked at our graph and you could do it manually or you can use a tool like Desmos, but our limits of integration, the intersection of those two curves is, uh, happens at negative two and one. And so our formula is going to be pi of big radius. Well, big radius, outer radius is negative x plus three, quantity squared. Subtract away inner area, which is pi little radius. Little radius is x squared plus one, end quantity squared, dx. And from there, there's a bit of algebra to be done. I'm not gonna do all of it, but a really sneaky way to, to realize is that if you've got pi times big R of x quantity squared minus pi times little r of x quantity squared, you can factor out pi from that expression. And so we're gonna do that. We're gonna pull pi through the integral. We know we can do that. And so this becomes, I sometimes think I use the square brackets, but I think it can be helpful to rewrite things in terms of round brackets, because in general, we're a little bit better at realizing that round brackets mean, oh yeah, I've got to distribute these values and do the algebra to collect like terms and stuff. Once you do that algebra, collect those like terms and integrate on the resulting expression, I have written on my paper uh, rather snarkily dot 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 algebras, 117 over five pi ends up being the volume of this region. And that's that. Thanks for listening.